Okay, so now let's look at some of the basic techniques for machine translation. So one of the fundamental ideas behind modern translation systems is that translation is actually just a method of decoding. So here's a famous quote. I want to read it aloud. One naturally wonders if the problem of translation could conceivably be treated as a problem in cryptography. When I look at an article in Russian, I say, this is really written in English, but it has been coded in some strange symbols. I will now proceed to decode. So this is a quote from Warren Weaver, one of the founders of information theory, uh, in a book called Translation, published in 1955, almost 60 years ago. So here's a question for the audience. If you know some French, at least, look at the next two slides, which have been uh, uh, translated automatically from uh, Google Translate, and see if you can figure out uh, whether uh, the system did a good job and what sort of mistakes uh, it made. So the documents are about a recipe in English. So look at the next two slides and pause as much as you need and go back and forth between them to figure out if you can uh, identify the translation uh, issues. So here's the original recipe, ingredients and then directions. So I'll just read one sentence here. Cook pasta in a large pot of boiling salted water until al dente. And here's the automatic translation from Google or in French. Cuire les pâtes dans une grande casserole d'eau bouillante salée jusqu'à ce qu'elles soient al dente. So uh, let's uh, spend a little bit of time and see what's wrong in those translations and also what works. I'm going to show you some examples on the next slide. So here's the answer. So I'm going to go back for a second. If you can see the last ingredient here, for some reason, has the uh, pound sign, which is probably just the way that uh, Google translated uh, one pound, which is really funny and incorrect. Let's look at some of the other problems here. So uh, I'll show you three of those. The first one is just not syntactically correct. Jusqu'à ce que presque ébullition. It means something like near uh, boiling point, but it's uh, grammatically incorrect. Then the next problem is the use of a sequence of verbs which form a very nice parallel structure in English. So in specifically, it's cook, reduce, simmer, stir, stir, drain, serve. So in English, all of those verbs appear as in imperative uh, sentences. Whereas in French, the translation is somehow mixed. It has the first one, cuir, uh, is as an infinitive, then réduire as infinitive, then one more infinitive, and then it switches to a noun, and then uh, another infinitive, and so on. And then uh, the last example that I want to show you is uh, some problem with agreement. So corvette is plural. And then uh, it is uh, listed as transparent, which is singular. It should have had an extra S at the end to indicate that it's plural. So in French, the problem is that uh, adjectives and nouns have to agree with each other in number and uh, gender in some cases. So uh, in this example, we have a disagreement. So let's see what causes uh, machine translation systems to have problems when they translate from one language to another. So there are many reasons. The first one is word order. So some languages are subject, verb, object, for example, English and Mandarin. Others are verb, subject, object, and others are subject, object, verb. So obviously in sentences like this, uh, when we have languages from different word order categories, we have to use some syntactic information to figure out uh, where uh, to move uh, the subject and the verb and the object. So here's another example with prepositions in Japanese. So in Japanese, the prepositions are actually postpositions. They are put after the word. So if you want to say something like to Mariko, in Japanese, you would say it as Mariko ni. Another example is inflection with an example in Spanish. In Spanish, the word have can be translated in many different ways, depending on the person and number of the verb and also whether it's infinitive or not. So tengo, for example, is first person singular. Tienes is second person singular, tenemos is first person plural, tienen is third person plural, and tener is the infinitive. All of those appear in English as have. So if we want to produce a system that translates from English to Spanish, we have to figure out what is the subject of have before we can uh, figure out the correct verb form. 
Some more examples. Lexical distinctions, again, with an example in Spanish. Uh, so here we are making a distinction between the word used in the two languages. So in English we say the bottle floated out, whereas in, English, in Spanish the correct translation would be la botella salió flotando, which means it left the place by floating or while floating. Another example in Japanese is a word that has multiple translations, is the word brother. So brother in Japanese can be either ototo, which is a younger brother, or onisan, which is an older brother. One more example of French, the word they in English can be translated as either il or elle, depending on whether uh, the group is feminine or masculine. So some more examples on the next slide. So word order in phrases. So for example, in French, the adjective typically follows the noun. So you say la maison bleue, the blue house, where the noun is before the verb in French. I'm sorry, the noun is before the adjective in French. Another example is uh, the, a much more complicated word order in Japanese. So you have, because of the subject, verb, object versus uh, uh, subject, object, verb order. So if we want to translate I like to drink coffee from English to Japanese. We have the word order in English as pronoun subject followed by verb followed by some uh, phrase that involves a verb and a noun. In Japanese, you would have to translate this as something like this. Uh, watashi wa kohyo no muno gaski desu, which means that watashi is I, so that stays in the right place. Wa is the subject marker, which was not in English. Kohi o is the direct object for coffee, and the object here appears before the verb. Nomu no is uh, the expression for to drink, so it's some no nominalization of the verb to drink. Ga is a marker of the topic, and then suki des is like, which because it's the verb of the sentence, it appears all the way to the end. So as you can imagine, translating from English to Japanese is much more difficult than, let's say, translating from English to a more similar language such as French. Uh, so the another example here is vocabulary in Spanish. So in English, uh, the word wall can have multiple meanings, uh, whether it's uh, an internal wall or an external wall. So the words in Spanish for this are pared and more. So obviously you need to understand the context of the document to come up with the correct translation of wall. And my, my final example is again in French. So we can have entire phrases that can be substituted for single words. So the word play in English as a noun indicating a drama or comedy in theaters. So play is translated in French as pièce de théâtre, or as you can probably guess, something like a piece of theater. But what's more important is that we can have many cases where one word in one language gets translated as multiple words in another language or vice versa, or maybe even multi-word expressions can be translated as multi-word expressions, but with a very different internal structure. Okay, now that we understand why machine translation can be difficult, let's figure out how we can build working machine translation systems. There are many approaches, and many of them are based on this triangle here. Uh, F here stands for French, E stands for English, but in many instances we can just use F to indicate any foreign language that is being translated into English. I stands for interlingua. Interlingua is some sort of semantic representation of the text that is not uh, dependent on the underlying language. And let's look at the different strategies. The first one that we're going to discuss is the so-called direct approach. The direct approach just says start uh, from the beginning of the foreign sentence and then look it up in the dictionary, one word at a time, and then translate into English. So obviously this doesn't take into account any of the problems that we discussed so far. So you can have ambiguous words, you don't know which uh, translation to pick, you can have syntactic disagreements and so on. So this approach was tried in the 50s and 60s before there were any powerful computers and any language resources such as uh, software or uh, like uh, parallel data or dictionaries. It's obviously a very naive approach that has no way to work. And I'm going to now show you two funny examples from uh, that time period that show uh, how bad it was. So in the first example, uh, people uh, were trying to build a system that translates from uh, English to Russian. And then to figure out if they did a good job, they, they manually tried to translate back from Russian into English to see if they get the same thing. So the sentence that they tried to give was, the flesh is weak, but the spirit is strong. So when the sentence got translated into Russian and back into English, people were 
uh, scared to see that the translation went like this. Uh, the meat is rotten, but the vodka is very good. So as you can see, that this is a very bad translation, but you can see why the system would make such a mistake. And the other funny example from that time is to translate this expression, out of sight, out of mind. So it went to Russian and back, and then it came back as a blind idiot. So you can see how bad it was. Another approach that was developed later is the so-called indirect transfer method. So in the transfer method, you have some set of grammatical rules that apply to different pairs of languages. So for example, in French, uh, the adjective follows the noun. In English, the noun follows the adjective. So you can have rules like this, and then once you identify the adjectives and the nouns, you can at least translate them in the right order. A third approach is to use something called interlingua. So interlingua is when you translate, let's say, the foreign language into some logical form, for example, uh, in the first order logic or model logic and then you use some generation to translate back from that interlingual representation to your target language. So, uh, here are some examples. If you want to translate, this is a blue house. With a direct approach, we would translate each word separately. With transfer, we would uh, make sure at least to get blue and house in the right order. And with interlingua, we would have some sort of logical representation. H is a house and H is blue. And then use generation to produce the English version. So uh, in the next segment, we're going to look at noisy channel methods for machine translation, which form uh, the basis of modern translation technology.